This is the Argument Ninja Podcast, episode 38. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This is the Argument Ninja Podcast, and I am your host, Kevin DeLaplante. The podcast has been on hiatus for several months while I've been focusing time on my business venture at Linker Consulting, which is in a steep growth phase right now. I'm not going to say any more about that here. That's really a subject for its own episode. But for today's show, I have an interview to share that I think you'll enjoy. Earlier in the fall, I was interviewed by Brittany Nicole Connor Savarda for a new podcast slash video interview show that she has recently launched that coincides with the publication of a book she's written on the topic of emotional intelligence. The book is called The EQ Deficiency, and it's got a big long subtitle, How Emotional Intelligence and Compassion Can Cure an Emotional Pandemic, Solve Our People Problems, and Be a Catalyst for Positive Change. Her podcast show is called Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence, and she lined up a series of interviews with people whose work either influenced her writing or that somehow resonates with it. My YouTube videos on tribalism and tribal psychology were what caught Brittany Nicole's eye. So I'm going to share the audio of this interview on this episode. I'll link to the YouTube video on her channel in the episode description and in the show notes. And I have a number of clips from the interview up on my YouTube channel. In this conversation, we covered most of the highlights of my views on tribalism, polarization, and the distorting effects it can have on our perception and judgment. I talk about the evolutionary roots of tribal psychology and the positive and negative aspects of tribalism, where the real risks are with increasing polarization, why certain kinds of truth-seeking communication can only happen in the interstitial spaces between ideologically charged tribal zones. I talk about how complexity is unstable within polarized groups, how the demands of social persuasion distort our judgment by forcing us to simplify complex issues. I talk about strategies for improving our emotional intelligence by neutralizing these distorting effects. Uh, I talk about the contextual nature of human character and human nature more broadly, and the resources that this fact can give us for improving our situations. We talk about different kinds of mental models for understanding human nature that are useful for thinking through our communication strategies if we want to have productive discussions that don't trigger defensive responses. And finally, towards the end, we talk about a multi-level, multi-scale approach, a meta-model, if you want, for understanding the causes of social change, which is also useful from a personal growth perspective. In the next episode of this podcast, my plan is to talk more about the work I've been doing over the past 10 months and what the near future looks like for me and my public-facing projects. But that's for another time. For now, I'm happy to bring you this interview with Brittany Nicole Connor Savarda. Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of the Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence podcast slash show. I'm your host, Brittany Nicole. Today's guest is coming to you from Canada. Kevin De La Plante is an independent educator and consultant specializing in critical thinking education and training for individuals, institutions, and businesses. I found Kevin on YouTube, which I will talk about a little bit later into the podcast as I was doing some research for my book, and I fell in love with his content because it was both informative and visual. So as a kid, Kevin was interested in the arts and sciences and thought seriously about becoming a professional cartoonist which is reflected in his content creation. And Kevin has a bachelor's in physics, a master's and a PhD in philosophy. And I love the way he breaks down somewhat complicated issues and human behaviors and objectively analyzes them. And that's what I love about philosophy. So I'm very excited to bring him to you as a guest today so you can learn from him as we talk about tribalism and how that plays into how we interact with each other, biases, and developing that self-awareness and understanding about tribalism so that we can incorporate that um, 
into our awareness when developing our emotional intelligence. I'm going to halt the breaks here for just a second. If you enjoy this podcast, and especially this episode, I think you would really find some value in the book that I just completed called The EQ Deficiency, where we talk about all of this stuff. And there's some quotes and information um, that I pulled from Kevin's content as well in the book. You can find that on Amazon. It's available in hardback, paperback, and ebook version. Now, without further ado, here is Kevin De La Plante. Well, hello, Kevin, again. (laughs) Hello. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited to interview you about this. Um, Again, I came across your work probably a year and a half ago now before I started writing the book. I was doing my research on tribalism and the correlation between um, emotional intelligence, so being self-aware, and how tribalism plays into our biases and how we interact with individuals. And I think you have amazing content um, on YouTube, and I found it other places as well, but you do a great job of illustrating and explaining tribalism among other human behaviors. So before we dive into that, can you tell the audience just in your own words a little bit about yourself? Um, Sure, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, I, um, I used to be an academic philosopher. I taught at Iowa State University for 16 years. And, um, and there I mostly taught philosophy of science and ethics and some general topics in the philosophy of ecology and some other fields. Um, but I left that, um, I left that career about five years ago, uh, because I wanted to do more kind of public outreach, public philosophy, education, And I think I always had that intent in mind to do that. When I started off in my academic career, I had intended on leaving at some point to shift gears and work in some, in a, um, in a, a more, a more public venue. Um, I started creating these videos uh, while I was in academic teaching. They initially started out as just support videos for like a flipped classroom teaching where you'd teach, you know, record a lecture so your students could see it when they're not in the classroom and you could spend more time in the classroom doing discussion and quizzing and other sorts of things. And then when I had enough of these built up, I had the idea of maybe putting them up on YouTube or putting up on, you know, on a membership site. So those, those uh, videos start way back probably 12 years ago now. The the more recent uh, videos on tribalism came about sort of as you know, after the 2016 election. It was after that, and there was uh, a lot of new reporting on the state of political discourse, especially in the American context, but it was also kind of more broadly around the world, a shift towards the right in terms of politics, and a lot more polarization among um, you know so- social groups, liberals and conservatives, or Democrats and Republicans, and a lot more animosity and hostility and suspicion of, of each side. And I realized this was a, a really important problem from a critical thinking standpoint, just from an ability to sort of, if you cared about uh, you know having true beliefs, not having false beliefs, and if you cared about having wa- making wise decisions. And if you cared about being able to think for yourself, uh, being an independent critical thinker, those are my three primary critical thinking values, then uh, you should care about the state of discourse and polarization and sort of the tribal psychology that's underpinning it, because that affects our ability to identify, recognize true beliefs, eliminate false ones, make wise decisions, and it affects our ability to think for ourselves. So every single pillar of that thing is impacted by um, the state of our, of our social environment and the freedom that we feel to, to think or argue about different topics. So I thought it was important to address that. And then that project kind of took on a a life of its own. So, so that's a part of the story. The other part of the story is I actually currently work right now as a, uh, not only as an independent sort of educator and consultant, but I work for a, a management a consulting firm where we're um, 
I'm partly responsible for crafting messaging for different companies and also helping them make good decisions. And I, I view it as a kind of applied philosophy in the sense that I'm trying to learn how to help people improve the quality of their decision making and thinking, if not at an individual level, then at an institutional level. So it's all part of one piece. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So before we really take a deep dive, what is tribalism? Because some people aren't familiar with that term. Right. And it's okay because the, a lot of these commonly used terms actually are used in different senses. And that's okay. It's kind of a, a mistake, I think, to try to um, stipulate a single meaning for a term when in fact there are multiple meanings in use. And people use them for different purposes. So when I talk about uh, tribalism, I want to stipulate a specific meaning for a specific purpose. So I want to, because I, I want to talk about this way in which our group, our group identities impact the way we make moral judgments and impact the way we make epistemological judgments or judgments about knowledge or rationality. So in that sense, I think of just a tribe as just a social group with which we identify based on some characteristic. It can be kind of arbitrary. It could be religion. It could be ethnicity. It could be a shared interest in the sports team, right? All these different ways in which we can identify with a group. And then tribalism is a set of behaviors and attitudes that uh, become, a, become are associated with this identification with, the, with that tribe. So part of the process involves identification with a tribe. It gives us a sense of who us is, who we are, our group identity, in contrast to some defined other, some of them. So it sets up an us-them distinction. And so this set of tribal behaviors and attitudes has to do with, on the one hand, moral judgments. We tend to think that uh, judgments of our tribe are, are, are better are more, more justified, more reasonable, and that judgments of those outside the tribe are somehow compromised or the more ignorant or they're, or, they're, or they're worse people, they have worse motives, and so on, so on. Uh, and then there's this um, uh, epistemological side or the kind about knowledge where we tend to view ourselves as having, holding the reasonable standpoint. Like we're connected to the facts and we understand mm -hmm. things well. And the other side, and when, when they differ from us, it's because they are either ignorant or they're cognitively compromised in some way or like blinded or they're, or, or they're biased or they've been fed a bunch of lies, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's that set of, pattern of associations, both uh, in our judgments about the moral status of, other, of, our, of our own actions and judgments versus other people and the status of the uh, rationality of, of, of other people that I, I call tribalism, or I should say that's tribal psychology. And that's the sense in which I'm using it. If you ask anthropologists or cognitive scientists or other sorts of professionals how they might use that term, they might use a different set of terms. Some people often will also, what I call tribalism, they'd call kind of negative tribalism or highly polarized tribalism. So they'll focus on the negative stuff and call that tribalism, but I'm not doing that. So when we talk about tribes, you know, this, this is inherent to us, right? We don't, we don't seek, I mean, we do seek people within that tribe, but it's at a very subconscious level. So let's talk about the history of that, because you're talking about anthropology, but it, it's rooted in our DNA. So what are the benefits? Because I think we're seeing a lot of the negative side effects of tribalism today, especially, and you talk about, and we'll talk about later, the extent of polarization and how that affects whether tribalism is going that direction of quote unquote negative in a sense. Um, less cooperation. I guess we could say that. But where does it stem from? Why do we gravitate towards tribes? Well, I think that story has to do with the evolution of our distinctive species. Homo sapiens is a social species. And it's not just a social species. It's, a, it's an ultra social species. And when anthropologists use that term, um, they mean something like when... Uh, when we, we, we form groups and we work together in groups, and these are groups not just tied together by kinship or genetic relatedness, um, which often happens in 
animal communities, right? Where you have tribes that are associated, where there's some kind of mating going on amongst them. So, and, but we have, we can make strong, we, we can make uh, tribal groups with humans that include strangers, like in a city where it's not just my local community that I, I, I'm, interacting with, but people who may be part of the, the of a city that I identify with, but are actually strangers to me. And yet I can feel a sense of connection to them, a sense of obligation toward them. Um, and, um, and so we can identify at that level and we can identify at that level in a way that we can do form, do, we can perform coordinated social acts together toward common goals. So that's ultra sociality. And we're that kind of species. Uh, and so, and it's the secret of our success. It's the secret of our genius as a species, why we are so secret. We're not all that impressive physically compared to other animals who are stronger and faster and otherwise more, you know, more dangerous than us. But when you put us together in groups and you, those groups, um, uh, have a kind of cognitive division of labor and an actual division of labor. So we've got different parts of the group performing different actions. Like if you're a hunting group you know, in some hunter gatherer, you know, scenario, we split up and we, and we have a coordinated system where some, some person member of the tribe performs one action and another, others do others in a coordinated way to take down the mammoth or whatever. And that's very unusual in the animal world to have that, have that kind of differentiation. Uh, but it's essential to our human form of, of sociality. So survival among groups requires this intense uh, relationship to others, to groups. That's that. probably the basis of how we formed language our, of our distinctively natural kind. It's probably the basis of why we have the big brains we do because of the demands of social living imposed that a new kind, being able to keep track of all these coordinated things, be able to, to, to model the, the mental states of other members. So when you look at that thing and point over there, I know that you're thinking about that object. And I know that about you. So my mental of you includes a model of your mental state. There's no other animal that does this the way that we do it, right? And it's all in the service of coordinated social activity. So as a byproduct of this, we absolutely need to be belong to groups. It's a survival necessity. And so we have developed an instinct for belonging to groups, where if we are not felt accepted and part of a group, then we are highly at risk. Mm -hmm. We are at risk of social isolation. The risk of social isolation is, in an ancestral environment, extremely high, like fatal. Right? You yeah. just don't survive on your own. And in our modern context, when you think about how that uh, plays out, we have a lot more ability to survive quasi-independently, right? But we have this deep instinct to belong so that, you know, when we talk about the epidemic of loneliness, that is pervade, that's a feature of, sort of modern social life and is me maybe getting worse. That loneliness, I think of, and other loneliness experts, think of it by analogy with something like hunger, where your body needs food sustenance and it sends a signal to your brain that you're going to be compromised unless you seek out food. Well, loneliness is that feeling that we have when we when our social needs are compromised, when we need to seek out belonging because we need the emotional and other kinds of support that belonging to a group is means. And so it should feel uncomfortable to us as an adaptation. The loneliness is something we try to uh, alleviate by joining groups. Uh, and so this is part of the conceptual scheme I think I have for this. It's it's fairly consistent with what a lot of psychologists think about, about it. Belongingness is treated as a fundamental psychological need on a par with uh, you know, other core, core psychological needs now. So it's no surprise that we have a natural instinct to seek out and bond with social groups. But now we have, in a modern co context, um, we have so many t types to choose from now and so much access, especially through the internet. It really, has, it really has a very unique moment in our history that we have the opportunity to connect with as many different tribal groups as we can. I think that probably is a source of confusion for us. Yeah, and I think, too, when it comes to loneliness, we're in a society that 
has become very egocentric in at least in western culture right it's about the self first than other people where i feel like eastern culture is more putting others first and then we come last and we sometimes forget living in a first world country that all the things we have takes other people but because we don't see them you know we flip on a switch we turn on the faucet water comes out we don't think of all the people that it takes to make that happen so we get into that mindset well we don't need anyone else and then the people that we do connect with again have those set of beliefs whether it's religious political and we stick to those but then we forget about all the people that may not fit into that specific tribe that we also are relying on every single day mm-hmm. so you know what are some we talked about the benefits of tribalism the feeling of connectedness and oneness and having those people to rely on and the fear of not being part of the tribe because of you know our ancestors that can mean life or death if we were rejected so how does polarization and disconnect play into the more I don't want to say, I mean, darker side of tribalism. What are we lacking with that? Sure. Before I answer that question, I want to add one more point to the the first answer, though. Another important element of the benefits of tribalism or sort of being groupish in our social behaviors is just about knowledge. It's like most of the knowledge that we have access to is not inside our heads. Mm -hmm. It's in the form of books or the internet, or other people that we can access socially through, you know, it's either in the artifacts in our environment or through or in, uh, other people. And we have this unique ability among species to learn new skills and new knowledge, and then we store it in this thing called culture. And it allows us to die, and then new children are born, and they get to access what we learned. It's essentially downloading what we learn from uh, through cultural t- cultural transmission mm-hmm. of knowledge and skills passed on. Uh, lots of animals have have uh, a kind of cultural transmission, but nothing quite like ours. Ours is distinctive, and so one set of illusions that we live under is that we think we're so smart and we know all the stuff. But if you ask us to explain how things work in the world. We, we quickly realize we're very limited in our understanding of even how basic things work. But we don't have to know these things to be functional because we have this distributed collective set of behaviors and systems set up so that when we need to know something, we sort of access it in the environment as opposed to have it all memorized or internalized. Sure. So that's another sense in which uh, our groupishness is an enormous asset. And we don't want to eliminate those parts of our human identity that make that possible, right? It's true. true. But it's part and parcel of the same set of social uh, psychological attributes. Anyway, so that's one point I wanted to include in there. Because I'm a tribalist. Some people think that I'm an, anti- an anti-tribalist. I've, I've, I've been called this. I'm not a joiner. I, I, I talk a lot about the... the, the um, the risks of joining up with political identity groups or ideological groups that it compromises our critical thinking skills. I have a whole whole line on that, which I believe somehow that's supposed to make me an anti-tribalist. But no, in fact, I'm strongly, I'm a strong proponent of the importance of collective social identity and and um, and uh, many of the dis- distinctively human and great things about us are tied to that social nature. So I'm not an anti-tribalist, but as you said, um, polarization is a really important topic. And those are different. That's different from tribal, from tribal psychology. So I view polarization as some measure of the distances between social groups, how, how, how different they are. And so you can measure it on any, any number of dimensions, ideological or, you know, how tall people are or what their preferences are for, uh, you know, music. And so you can imagine how close one group is to another versus how far apart they are on some metric. 
classical music versus hard heavy metal <laughs> would be farther apart than <laughs> right than yeah. di different shades of classical um right so so polarization is a measure of not just of how different groups are but most importantly perhaps how different the groups are perceived to be by mm -hmm. the members themselves so if i'm a person within a group and i ask myself about that group over there that individuals in that group over there how similar or different are they to, to to me, my answer will reflect my understanding of, of those differences. And if I think they're very different from me, like very different, versus some other group that's much less different, I will have a whole different set of behaviors and attitudes directed toward them than the other group. Uh, so because the, the perceived polarization is, is so high. Um, and, um, and effectively, I mean, the the problem is that if you think, if you imagine um, degrees of polarization as like the, the regions of overlap of our different bubbles, of our different tribal bubbles, mm -hmm. and if they're like a Venn diagram almost, right? Where if there's a lot of overlap, then the quality of our relationships is just different. Like, and especially when it comes to the quality of our ability to disagree with each other. We can have conversations, we can be friendly, we can, be, we can disagree, but I never once challenge your entitlement to be treated like a person or respect for your, for your ability to reason about these issues. I might disagree, I might get heated, but there isn't a breakdown in our ability to recognize each other as you know, moral agents, rational agents, and so on. One thing I think about when you say that is, for example, let's use the Christian faith, right? But you have all these denominations. So you have Methodist and Catholic and Lutheran and Baptist. So those are very different within themselves, but they all fall under the umbrella of Christianity. So while they have disagreements, they still agree on one thing. They're Christian, right? Is that versus the difference of someone who's Muslim versus Christian or atheist versus Christian? Well, if you, yeah, I mean, if you treat it um, as a as an objective measure of differences, then that's what one way of, of talking about it. And you could say that in that, in that case, there are fewer differences between different Protestant denominations than, be, than be between any of those and say Islam or, or uh, Buddhism. Uh, but as I said, the, the sort of psychological attitude one has can vary widely. So within a particular Protestant denomination, you could have a fairly intense form of ideological attachment to that particular denomination. And it is not uncommon, for example, for certain hardcore Protestants to think that, for example, Catholics are not Christian, right? They are of a different order entirely. And so, I mean, they will say that. And then someone who comes from a kind of religious studies background, who sees all of this as different denominations within a larger Christian structure, that's a shocking thing to hear. What do you mean Catholics aren't Christian? They're just a different type of Christian. But they'll go, oh, no, no, no. There's, here's real Christianity. Mm. And they're some kind of false or ersatz kind of Christianity. So it says, ah, oh, okay, so that's a very, they, they, they view themselves as highly polarized, right? Um, maybe as highly polarized as Islam is to them. Interesting. Um, Interesting. So the internal perception um, is maybe the more important measure mm -hmm. rather than the, some objective measure of, of difference or distance. It really matters sense. how you feel about it, right. how different you think you are from them. Right. That's what matters. Um, I mean, you have, uh, and it's, and there's so few constraints on this. You can have, for example, tribal animosities in, say, in African villages or African nations um, that go back where the external, you can't see a, a, um, a visual difference in ethnicity among the people who are warring, but they see themselves as very different because of a certain set of cultural, ethnic, religious history. And so uh, what matters there is, is, again, their interpretation of their identity, as opposed to some objective set of measures, right? Mm. And uh, we know how this varies. It, like, uh, it's interesting, like in, um, in, in the U.S., the difference between people who will identify as white versus black or white versus people of color 
is like any, sh- you know, any shade off of a particular kind of normative Caucasian is regarded as a person of color, which includes this huge rainbow spectrum, of colors yeah. spectrum, right? That's a distinctively kind of American division. Whereas if you go to Africa, the divisions are, are much different. Uh, so a lot of it's cultural. Uh, how you I make the division, learn the division, uh, recognize it is itself something that's learned often. And that's probably an, just a generally important point the, that you can learn them and then you can also unlearn them, which is an, an optimistic feature. But the, the real threat, of course, is that when you see yourself as a very alien from another group, their behavior is regarded as irrational or evil or, or uh, motivated by the worst intentions, then that licenses all sorts of behaviors against them that you would never uh, um, allow yourself to, to do to members of one's own tribe. And there you get racism and bigotry and, and intolerance and and genocide in the worst cases, right? Right. Where, uh, yeah, dehumanization. Those are the worst cases, and they're all kind of uh, a byproduct of really excessive polarization. I think it's interesting the way you were talking about, you know, you were saying that you were not anti-tribalism, um, but some people view you that view you that way. And I think a lot of people, whenever we try to, because I try to come from a very objective perspective and try to see both sides to a situation. Now that doesn't mean that I won't gravitate more towards one side than the other, but I will try to at least hear the other side out or look at their lines of reasoning and then make my own decision. In certain cases, I do kind of sit in the middle where I can see the pros and cons of of both situations, but a lot of people do not like they call you fence sitters, right? Indecisive. You need to choose one or the other because it's almost like they can't trust you if they if they don't know whose side you're on or which side you're on. So why is it that um, that that scene is more of a negative versus a positive being objective because we say as a society, we like people who are open-minded and able to see both sides to a story or change their perspective on, on something once they've obtained new information. I don't know if you got to the part in the book about um, Julie Zimmerman about the, uh, it was, it was all over the, she wrote an article in the Atlantic where she saw a two minute clip of a situation. And then the next day she saw the like two hour clip of that same situation. And she said, you know, now that I have this new information, Mm -hmm. my perspectives changed and she got backlash from both sides whenever she did that. And I feel like that's, but that's what we need in a society that is so divided is someone like that to bring us together and be objective. I, uh, I remember that story and I remember reading about it in, in, in the book again. And uh, yes, yeah, st- it, it's interesting, this um, genre of people talking about places where they've changed their mind. And uh, they're viewed as kind of heroes by some of us. When you tell the story about, I used to believe this and I was very dogmatic about it. And then afterwards, upon reflection and so on, Um, I changed my mind and we all go clap, 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 clap. Right. Some people, some people, well, well, it's to to your, to your point. Yeah. There's a division about uh, attitude towards if you're very partisan on the issue, Mm -hmm. then you're going to say, well, you were right the first time, but you're wrong now, or you were always wrong, you know? Uh, But the fact, but there is this, uh, group of people who now view that kind of uh, humility and willingness to change as, as a rarity, enough of a rarity that it's worth applauding, right? It's, no, it's not normalized because so we, we, it stands out because we, we, we see it so rarely. So, so especially in the media, where most of the media has been structured to be partisan, um, so we're seeing one story hammered over again and again from a certain perspective. Mm-hmm. You don't see those people 
uh, you know, Fox News nor CNN is going to have uh, people who are editorial spokespersons for that, you know, the line they've been pushing for years, all of a sudden just go, you know, I was I'm probably wrong about that. You know, they can't. There's too far too much, too much social pressure. That is a form of, of, of tribalism as well, that sense that I am – um, and it speaks to the original question about what's, what's the social dynamic going on here. And it's, it's a persuasion dynamic. It is rather than, rather than a kind of get to the truth dynamic. And because we know what sorts of virtues are necessary for truth seeking behavior, truth, you know, finding out the facts, you've got to be somewhat dispassionate. You've got to be flexible to do evidence. You've got to be willing to revise your account in the face of new evidence. You've got to question assumptions. You've got to check your own bias, all these things. Um, and um, which makes your, your positions necessarily tentative at every stage of the process. They're, they're open to, to change. But that set of attitudes is not general valued within in terms of like social persuasion like if i'm trying to um get some body to accept some policy initiative or persuade uh the voters to vote on this healthcare package or persuade us to go to war or not go to war over a particular topic or who to vote for in the next election those are regarded as social persuasion uh context where the goal is to persuade not necessarily to persuade for good reasons. Usually, if, if it's highly partisan, the people who are on the you know, on each group already think their reasons are good. Mm. Their goal is to make change. Their goal is to essentially win, have a specific outcome. And so it's it's an it's a uh, the context is about social change and social influence. And if, and and when that's the, when that's the context. Uh, you just need a, I mean, the smart thing from that d point of view is to be uh, one-sided, to be fairly dogmatic, to um, straw man the opponent's positions, to um, cast them as suspicious or otherwise. All those things that we think of as negative, those are smart things from a social persuasion standpoint. They are effective. And so you're thinking more like, a soldier mentality than like a scientist mentality where our goal is to win the battle, not to like, you know, work out the ideological issues around our difference. Once we have set our goal is that we're in conflict with this group and we have to beat them. Then um, the, uh, the parameters have changed. Like, but do you feel like that's been benefiting us as a society today when we have so much discord like, I understand it's definitely beneficial and, you know, the power of persuasion and, and how that works in our society. But because we are so polarized and people are filtering all of this information that not all of it is factual, do you think that that urge to be more persuasive and right to win that battle is benefiting the future of our um, of humanity. <laughs> it's a big, it's a big uh, topic, right? Um, no, I would say, no, the way in which this is playing out right now, the sort of heightened period of polarization where even where lots of things are being sucked up into um, a political ideological uh, tornado almost. It feels like you, you, there's this whirlwind going on and is only uh, and there's the social forces that are um, impacting speech and impacting. I said, guess the the incentive structure for speech and, and political action is such that you can be highly, very severely punished for saying the wrong things to to the wrong people, right? Um, and you can be highly rewarded by these other groups. So these these reward punishment thing is set up where your tribal identities are associated with within my tribe, I get a lot of support for saying these things that supports the tribe standpoint. I am their champion. I am their, I am, I'm fighting the good fight. 
they support all that. And so for me, I have this whole positive incentive structure for being someone who is, who is advocating for a, a certain viewpoint. And uh, I think it's bad on a number of reasons. One is um, it distorts. Well, this is where I get to the issue that all, I think any form of strong ideological identification narrows our critical thinking ability. So we, we end up having a distorted view of, of the other side. We end up having a distorted view of reality because it colors our interpretation of the facts. And it ends up distorting our own view of, of ourselves often as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of blinder that is adaptive in the sense that given the goals of winning a certain kind of ideological war, it's useful to think of the other side as less than as irrational, as villains, right? That's almost a precondition for that, just as it is with with other kinds of human conflict, like war, like part of the natural state of getting soldiers and countries in a position where they're comfortable waging war against is against some other opponent is a kind of systematic dehumanization of, of the enemy. So that things that we could never think of doing to them in their ordinary course of affairs all of a sudden become uh, reasonable, acceptable things to do. It's, it's a playbook that has to be run. You have to dehumanize the enemy. You have to do these things. Otherwise, I mean, soldiers have to be trained hard to be, for them to be in the position to do this. We've made it easier and easier with sort of long-distance warfare. But then the public has to be behind it as well. And so you have to, you essentially have, you know, sponsored propaganda campaigns to get the public to support an initiative because they have to make the other side be perceived as, as, as a real threat. Right. And, and all of that makes, has a certain kind of natural logic to it. It's not surprising, but we, we seem to be depl- to deploy it in so many non-essential ways. It, we, we want to be able to d- deploy that kind of coordinated thing if there's a very serious real threat, right? Right. Then we want to be able to recognize the threat for what it is and, t- and collectively coordinate ourselves so we can stop that threat. But what we have is this weird fractioning of every little issue gets right. treated like that by some, you know, it's like a nested set of little wars, where the war psychology is the active psychology and, and the sort of scientist psychology or the critical thinking psychology only has room to operate in the, in the interstitial areas between these overlapping kind of war zones. If you, if you can imagine my visual model here of all these sort of bubbles that are sort of tribally charged areas of social action and, and attitudes. And within those bubbles, you are the incentive structure to go along with the tribe and to demonize the other side is really high. So to escape that, you've got to kind of exit yourself from a bubble and, and maybe find these other little bubbles of people who think the way you, you do too. Maybe like you and I talking right now are part of one of those bubbles. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but it's like we have to have room and there's less room within the broader public, the broader society to have that, those attitudes be acceptable. Because uh, there's so much, it's so much. Like I, I think of these as sort of using the mathematical notion of an attractor, where there's a naturally stable you, ideas get sucked into whatever the the local attractor is, and it's really hard to release an idea into this environment and fly to its target without getting blown off course by the sort of ideological winds or the social, pol- you know, the polarized winds shifting back and forth or get sucked into some narrative where you, what you said is interpreted by some group one way or an interpreted by another group another way. So it even compromises our ability to say what we mean. To speak in this environment is to involve distorting our ability to be understood. So we have to, you know, it's, a very, it's one of the reasons why I say very little on social media. Yeah. Because those environments are ones where I cannot control the interpretation of what I say. Exactly. It will get distorted in a second. Exactly. And I would rather have a place where I get to, you know, I have that maybe, maybe the privilege of this, but to be able to write down something carefully, thoughtfully, have a place where p- people can look it up and read it. And I get to control that narrative. Um, well, it's so like no, gravity. I don't think this is good. <laughs> no, it's like gravity. And where 
you know, it may be a solar system of all these little planets thinking of the tribes, you know, that have a gravitational pull, but you can escape it versus a black hole that now we're getting sucked into. And it's very difficult to escape that black hole because yeah. of the polarization and the density to that. Um, I like these little gravitational wells. And another important feature of this, if you want to play with this model a little bit, of these tribal bubbles, the more, the more kind of intense they are, the more certain things are true about them. One of them is the, is the idea that complexity is unstable within these bubbles. And what I mean by that is when there's an issue where there is uh, you know, pros and cons on either side, and the arguments for and against may well be compelling. And you re recognize it's actually a complex issue, like nuclear power. Is it safe or unsafe? Well, it's got these virtues and it's got these vice, you know, vices, these pros, these cons, and it's it's a tricky thing to get at. Um, or you know, policy around borders and immigration. A, it's a complex issue. There's pros and cons. I kind of see the point of view. That kind of complexity, which usually is a sign that you're seeing a broader picture, mm -hmm. you are seeing the broader. Uh, let the landscape of values and the landscape of consequences of a certain a policy, you actually have a more accurate picture of the world. But it's not obvious what you should do. It's not mm -hmm. obvious what the next action step should be when you're confronting complexity. In those environments, that is an unstable situation to be in, in a polarized environment where the whole goal is to, is to, have it, is to be action-oriented. You want to do something. So in order to be able to justify a choice to do act, say, in accordance with the ideology, you have simplified the description of reality. It can't be that it's one side, the other side, eh, it's got to be one side has terrible arguments and your side has great right. arguments. Otherwise, you'd have paralysis by analysis, right? Exactly, exactly. So this is an unstable, when I say complexity is unstable, which means in those bubbles, we go for simple um, analyses of of our situation and they are adaptive because they allow for action uncomplicated you know quick responses to things we know what the next thing is to say and do right uh but it's, it is often unmoored from reality or it's at the cost of of um totally misrepresenting the views of the of the opposition that's the situation i see it over and over it this description of 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 even the best little bit of of uh, a bit admitting the complexity of a social policy issue if you're in an ideologically polarized tribe that idea has to be squelched right away it's got to be a strong pro or a strong con nothing in between yeah and all subtlety and all you know all that stuff has to be is marginalized is pushed out and that's where I think where a lot of the people who are in these interstitial tribes, these sort of critical thinking oriented, uh, let's, let's not be, um, you know, our judgment be clouded by this tribal stuff, have been marginalized from, from those groups. They don't want to be compromised in that way. They want to be able to talk about the nuance, and there's no place to do it there. So they have to find their own space. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, tying this back to emotional intelligence, self-awareness specifically, we have to become aware of our innate need to be a part of a group, but also looking at the pros and the cons. We kind of have to be that person that analyzes this and says, is this helping me or hurting me? Because there's family members who voted for the opposite person, you know, from who, whom I voted for, and that caused a massive strain in our relationship, which is amazing when you think about it, that this is your flesh and blood, but a difference in opinion on public figures who you support can cause that much of a strain and an almost complete divorce from that family member, right? So having this self-awareness, so what do you think is the a good strategy for us to be able to break free of that gravitational pull, if you will, from the polarization that it brings. It's a tough one, um, right? Because it's, um, 
it requires probably like a multi-pronged approach. I do like uh, ba- basic education as a foundation around this issue. So learning about the psychology. If you were someone was to absorb everything in Jonathan Haidt's books, right? The Righteous Mind and others, or the others in that genre that talk about our moral psychology. And that alone, if you were to understand those principles, those ideas, it would be eye-opening. It would hopefully help to make one reflect upon our instinctive judgments and, and make us want to find perspectives that we can, you know, we can look at relationships and our, our own reactions and things from, from a bit of a distance. The other set of skills, and I know this is also part of the emotional intelligence community sort of set of applied things, is is um, the set of therapeutic kind of practices. Mindfulness is is one of them. So you become more aware of your own reactions, your own mental state, how you're responding to things. Uh, the, I mean, you want to be able to move to a point where you're not simply reacting, but you're responding. Right. Right. Um, from a place of, of sort of considered judgment rather than bam, right? That reflex. And part of it is becoming attuned to those, you know, pathways. Um, right. Recalibrating a bit. Recalibrating, slow thinking, being able to do that. that was, those are hard to do because uh, I'm, uh, some of that is, is, I think, you know, tied to, you know, a personality traits that can be hard to hard to shift for some people or they have deeper roots, you know, uh, also being part of groups, right? So, so much of our ability to behave in the ways we want is, can be affected by the groups and environments in which we are situated. I do believe that character, character traits are much more contextual than people tend to think. I think it's a, it's a, I think this is consistent with the psychology of character as well, that, when we think of character as a, a disposition to behave in a certain way under a certain environment, except if I say Tom is an honest person, generally it means I'll predict that Tom is going to behave in certain ways in certain situations that display the trait of honesty. But um, it's it's tempting to think of that trait of honesty as like um, an intrinsic feature of Tom that follows him around no, no matter what environment he's in. Right. And uh, I think there's tons of evidence that character doesn't work this way. Um, that is, it's much more like, if you think about a chessboard as being like the character traits are intrinsic view, like you have a, a rook that moves up this way and this way, up and down and, and across, and then the bishop moves along diagonal. Those are intrinsic behaviors. They're intrinsic to the piece. They're always the same no matter where they are on the board or who they're next to. Human beings are, aren't quite like that. Um, it's much more like um, if you had a, a chess piece that had a basic set of moves, but when you moved it next to another piece, the set of moves changes because of its proximity or to other pieces around it. So imagine this really complicated version of chess, like, like it's contextual chess. You, p- you make a piece, you move it over, and all of a sudden the things it can do or is disposed to do is a function of not only of its intrinsic properties, but also the intrinsic properties of the other pieces in its configuration around it and the relationships they have on the board. So all of a sudden, it's not just a function of me. It's a function of the other person plus the set of associations that we're in, the configuration that we're in. Then that's the thing that determines what I can do or what I'm disposed to do. And... This is like, you know, Tom's at home. He's always a certain kind of guy, but in a work environment, he's stealing, he's stealing paper every day and he's lying about his work performance. But in other contexts, he would never dream of being that dishonest. Right. Right. So his disposition is highly contextual. Character is like Very true. Hitler and other sorts of, you know, horrible people still have these pockets in their in their social lives where they have norms and behavior that we would recognize as being good. Uh, and then these other areas where they're awful, you know, that kind of compartmentalization is extreme in the, in those cases, but we all exhibit it to a, a certain extent and uh, recognizing that in ourselves, I think it's, it helps our emotional intelligence to come to realize that um, 
one of the ways I can make myself a better person is to change my environment because it's not just up to me. Right. It's not through an act of will alone, a heroic act of self-transformation that I make myself this better person because our behavior is also a function of the contextual things. So change my context and all of a sudden these other behaviors are become natural, become a part of the norm because yeah. of the dependency. So if you can figure it out, how that works, like curiosity, for example, I know you wrote about the importance of, in terms of mindset of adopting an attitude of actual curiosity towards other people and subject matters. You know, it's so helpful. Well, you, they've done studies of this and you can put people in a group of five curious people and all of a sudden they become more curious because of the social impact of yeah. being around people who exhibit that trait, right? Yeah, very true. I mean, even with weight, because uh, they say if you have friends like who are in really good shape, and let's say you're overweight, but you spend time around those people, they don't have to tell you about their diet or exercise regimen, right? but because you're around them, you actually can lose weight um, being around those people. So that's very true. And going back to what you were saying before about character traits, I think there's so many things in life that we attach as part of our identity that are really just beliefs and indoctrinations. But whenever we attach that as who we are and not what we've been raised to believe, then it's harder to break free of those beliefs because we feel like we're losing a part of who we are. So I think we have to start separating that as uh, detach that from our identity and see it as just that it's belief systems. If we erase somewhere else, we would have a completely different system of beliefs and potentially character traits. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it can be a product of your contingent history. Like you have, you have early childhood trauma around something, or you have abandonment issue, or you have some other, other kind of thing. And you have, end up having some core set of beliefs around which there's a protective shell, like a trigger. Like mm -hmm. as soon as those are threatened, that is perceived as a threat to your identity and you're immediately defensive and protective, right? You're not open to the, you know, entertaining options, alternatives, because you feel that if, if those are under threat, you lose who you are. You, who am I then if I'm not this? Right. Right. And people have those, those, I think we all have some, those in some places inside us and, and being able to recognize that, being able to see where we are, where in our, in our shell, shell of beliefs, some of them are just totally inconsequential. Like, it doesn't matter to me if I said, I think I said this in a video somewhere, if someone, if I said uh, some actor was born in a certain country and someone said, no, I don't think she was. And I'm like, okay, uh, I'll probably take your word for it. Maybe we'll look it up on Wikipedia or something. I'm not going to defend it because it doesn't matter to me. If I'm wrong about that, it doesn't matter. But then if you go a little bit closer to something that does matter, like maybe my judgments about um, healthcare policy, let's say, I actually do think there's something at stake here if I'm wrong about this, or immigration policy. Then if it matters more to me about whether, it, it, if it matters more to me if I'm wrong, then I'm more likely to look for, be critical of, perspectives, be willing, want you to, to defend it, but still be open. It'll, but it'll take more than someone's say so right. to, to move beyond this, right? And then as you get real close to this inner core, all of a sudden, it's quite a heroic act if I change my mind on that. You shouldn't expect that to happen. You should be, um, you know, the whole, the, the prescription for addressing, for addressing people in terms of their core beliefs issues is I think I call it the Indiana Jones swap. <laughs> you know, in the first movie, when Indiana Jones has to steal the, uh, in the opening scene has to steal the the gold statue mm -hmm. off the tablet, and he and he has to if he leaves it off, he's going to get shot with arrows or something. Right, he's going to trigger some defense mechanism. Right, so he has to have this bag of sand, whatever that is the same weight, and he's got to swap them out quickly. So that the system doesn't know that you've take, you've changed something, and so it doesn't trigger the defense mechanism. So imagine someone's core identity as being, say, um, a devout Catholic, right? 
And if you think you're going to engage with that person in a way that challenges them on that point, when it's core to them, you should be prepared to that, that to be a failed process. But also, the only case it'll work is if there is some other set of beliefs that can be moved into place that can perform the same role in terms of grounding someone's identity in the same way that that did. Otherwise, it'll collapse. Otherwise, you, 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 um, you fragment someone. Right. You destroy their identity, which is a horrible outcome. Right. So swap it out. And that almost never happens. And, no. and, yeah. and, it, and if it does happen, it happens sort of one little brick at a time. And I think that's, that's where our approach is. Um, our initial approach is to change someone's mind, to persuade someone that they are wrong and we are right. Instead of modeling certain behaviors and then they have that new information to take into account they feel less threatened. We're not a threat to them. We're not trying to change them, but they start to see this alternative perspective. I don't know if you know, have you heard of Daryl Davis? No. Um, I, I recommend that you check him out. I think you'd be very intrigued by his story, but he lives in the U S he's an international blues musician, but he's also an activist and he was a military brat and his parents worked for the, embassy, the U.S. embassy. So he lived all around the world. And being an African-American, I think he was like 10 years old. I believe this. I could be wrong. I believe this was in the 60s. But he was in a parade when he was 10, and he was holding the American flag and, and marching. And all of a sudden, he started being hit with debris from spectators in this group of uh, parade viewers. Um and at first he was like, these people must hate the scouts because that was the group he was marching with. And it wasn't until his scout leaders came and surrounded him and took him out of that situation that he realized that it wasn't the scouts, it was him that they were attacking. And that was the first time he had ever experienced racism. So a lot of us, when we would have an experience like that and experienced hate from an outside group, that may influence um, uh, a certain, um, gosh, what is the word I'm looking for? Resentment towards that group, right? Mm -hmm. But instead, he formed this question at a very young age of 10 years old. How can you hate me when you don't even know me? And he wanted to answer that question. So he started reading up on white supremacy and racism and neo-Nazism and all of these things. And he said, it still never answered my question. I learned a lot about them and never answered my question. So then he started to attend as an observer, KKK rallies, <laughs> this black man, you know, going to these KKK rallies and he met with a Klan leader, never tried to convince these people that they were wrong ever, but just asked questions and got to know their, their perspective and point of view. And then he began to befriend these people and it took years for some of them, mm -hmm. but over the course of this time, he has influenced over 200 KKK members to turn in their robes, denounce racism, all from him coming from a place of understanding and modeling a behavior that I am not what you perceive to be true. And the majority of us are not that stereotype. Mm -hmm. So I think that if we all approached it that way, coming from a place of understanding, being curious about the other side, and then just simply modeling a behavior um, that goes against that held stereotype without trying to convince, we would uh, be able to find that commonality that mm -hmm. we need in life. Mm -hmm. I think one of the one of the lessons of those kinds of examples is that uh, attitude change with those core at that, at that core level is um, is a marathon and not a sprint. Mm -hmm. Right, you you should be imagining this is the long game, and um, and I do think I recognize this individual from your from your uh, yeah yeah description of him. But these are cases of, and a lot of cases reports people who have left hate groups. We'll talk about their um, relationships that helped them do that, as being one of acceptance by someone from the out group that they otherwise have been taught to demonize. 
and they just accept them and they're just curious and they don't really try to change minds, but they're just sort of inviting them to be a part of their lives. And then they, once they accept that thing, then it's this gradual process of, of this relationship um, causing me to reassess my understanding because at every point you're violating the stereotype that I have been taught in right. an ongoing way. And it's, it is a testimony to how resilient the stereotype is that you don't change things right away. But uh, one counterexample, mind you, as a matter of brute rationality, one counterexample doesn't necessarily undermine a generalization, right? So one can hold on to the saying, think that, oh, most people like you are going to be like X, even though you're different. Right. right. That's one way of people, you know, maintaining racist beliefs, even though they end up having relationships that are friendly mm-hmm. with people from some other group, uh, because they think, well, you're the exceptions and I, I'm not really including you. So how, that's a kind of, you know, cognitive dissonance. That, that you do hear that a lot though. You do hear that a lot that, so, well, you're the exception. I've heard that about other groups before too. Um, well, I really like so-and-so, but they're so different. But then the question is, but how many people have you interacted and engaged with as intensely as you have this person? You know, where are you getting this information from? From the media? You know, does the media portray the majority or the minority? Right? Right. Right, right. Yeah. 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 It's, um, uh, I, I tend to be sympathetic to people who are raised, really raised in, um, certain cultures where there are some definite attitudes, which we now from the outside, you'd say, well, that's a racist or a sexist or a whatnot set of ideas. And when you go out in the world, you're going to encounter, you know, different viewpoints and you're going to need to change your mind in them at some point. I, I do feel sympathy for that because that process is not easy. It's, it's, um, it wouldn't be easy for any of us. And, right. um, and, so I don't, I don't get much mileage out of condemning someone's, you know, initial right. resistance, right? What's the point of that? That's human nature. Of course they're going to resist. And we don't know what we don't know. If we've never been exposed and we're seeing the, that group or ideology as a threat, then why would we want to be open to that? Mm-hmm. I mean, like you said, um, you have to be sympathetic and empathetic to their situations. But at the same time, there's a difference between ignorance, a lack of knowledge, and then having that knowledge, having that exposure, and then still coming from that place of hatred towards that group. Mm-hmm. Would you agree? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, um, these are hard questions. To, <laughs> um, to assess, well, one of the pro- the objections you'll hear from, if you interpret the way our, our attitude that we're voicing here is a kind of tolerance for the intolerant, because that's important for getting, important for making it reasonable to expect them to change their mind over time, is otherwise you're just going to reinforce their, if you, if you fight fire with fire, they're going to reinforce their perception of you. So this attitude of acceptance and tolerance for intolerance is, is a kind of noble ideal. And, you, and there are cases where it works. But from another side, another standpoint, the politically active side is like, um, that's an indulgence. Yeah. It's been how many decades, centuries that our, our particular social group has been handicapped here. And... Um, and uh, it's okay for us to insist on change, even when it upsets people and whatever we want. We're going to take our, our, um, our rightful entitlements and affirm ourselves and support ourselves. Um, so this is where you get political activism that has a, has a much more stronger stance to it. The rhetoric is stronger. It's much more uncompromising. Um, and within those social groups, the rhetoric is viewed as an as a representation of their of dignity. Like I'm not going. I'm going to assert my my entitlement to be treated w- with with respect, to be recognized as an equal, regardless of whether you recognize it or not. And I'm going to create a space where that's possible. And I'm going to insist that society recognize that. So that's that's activism. 
you got to respect that too. Cause a lot oh, of powerful yeah, changes happen on, on the back of that. And, and I agree. I mean, I, and, and I see that, you know, I don't think that it's fair to not have those same rights. Right. And that's, that's where it's like, people can hear what I'm saying and misconstrue it. Right. Because I like, for example, with African-American and the, um, the African-American community and systemic racism, I see that it exists, right? And I do believe that everyone deserves the same rights. And I do believe that a lot of people, regardless of whether it's labeled as having the right rights, do not have that. But I also have family members who were brought up racist, right? And haven't been exposed. And so while I completely disagree with their ideology and their mindset, it's trying to find, if possible, that balance like Daryl Davis did was saying, I don't agree with you. I think you're completely wrong in your approach and how you view me. But I also know that by condemning you, I'm not going to change your way of thinking. Right. So it's kind of like, Yes, there needs to be drastic change. So you have the activist, but at the same time, if you, and that changes, I feel like policy more so than at an individual level, whereas Daryl Davis's approach is he's definitely an activist, but he also changes people at their core. One person at a time. One person at a time from a different approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I like this hierarchical model, by the way, this site, this idea that, you know, social change, um, because societies and social phenomena are multi-level phenomena. They have they're grounded in part in human nature and individual personalities, and they also uh, also have a, a set of causes that operate at a higher level of organization that are social. And then, uh, even broader than that, you've got historical historical factors and other even maybe global factors at some point. Global, you know. Geopolitical stuff can have an impact on on the color of of our uh, of our lives. Um, so the hierarchy is there. Um, it's probably a mistake to think that you could that the root cause is is, is at one level or the other, right? So it's probably a mistake. And I think maybe um, those of us who were really keen on rationality, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, mindfulness, uh, critical self reflection our our probably our mistake when when we make a mistake is thinking there's putting too much emphasis on the individual and and thinking modeling change thinking of driving social change by driving individual change first as though it had to be bottom up like that mm. um so that's this kind of change one heart one mind at a, at a time approach and the whole thing will spread and um the reality is probably that they have this multi-level phenomenon, and when you when you do political activism also at the uh, at the higher levels at the group level, that can have these dramatic, fast changes. Like how quickly, for example, gay marriage became a minority view to a majority view within the U.S. context. A small number of years after many decades of of social work, how quickly m most recently the black lives matter movement in relationship to that it came up over the past few months during the, the pandemic and how that has produced this sort of phase change in social, social attitude or social or social norms um, about, you know, large groups of cult large cultural groups now signing on to the need for some kind of a reform in their practices and their attitudes. Bam. It's like there was a social tipping point right. Right, that happened. And it may well be that these individual relationships where we're sort of changing one heart to one mind at a time is a necessary, maybe precondition, but it's not sufficient in some cases. That is social dynamics play a role here. There's sort of a collective, it's part of our tribal identity. We are sensitive to how the, um, um, how the rest of our social tribes feel. And if everyone in my group says, it's okay to do that now, all of a sudden, boom, mm. a, switch, a switch goes on because I'm, I'm responding. My social IQ is that now all of a sudden, what used to be um, a risky 
stance to take is now socially acceptable. Oh, that's a, and that's a really good point. That's a really good point because it's not necessarily always top down or bottom up. It's coming from both ends, but at the same time, you know, I think about how, you know, society, this is how you should think, this is what you should believe, right? And like you were saying, if our entire tribe changes their ideology or way of thinking, then we adopt that because we are part of that tribe. However, I think that it's also important for us to understand why and come from a deeper level so we can start to embody that um, ourselves instead of just following the tides, mm -hmm. right? I, and I agree with that 100%. In fact, that would be a great a model for, I mean, the understanding where you go from social, local, you know, individualistic, and then even sub-individual, that is, at some point, and I, I'm sure that you would agree with this, there's a, there's a perspective on a level of description of, of a human behavior where really what we're talking about is the orchestration of dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and whatever, whatever the neurochemicals and hormones that regulate attitudes and, and behavior, the strongest things. Mm -hmm. So literally some, some level of description that's sort of micro neurochemical when I now have a positive feeling toward you that I didn't have before. What that is, is some kind of new orchestration of, inter of my internal right. state that makes me feel good in your presence. That feels, whereas there was some other, other orchestration of chemicals that made it uh, struck fear and anxiety or, or distrust or whatever. That, that was the um, interpretation before. Yeah. And uh, so that's very micro. Right? You wouldn't want to do social policy trying to do that, trying to do <laughs> engineer everyone's, you know, serotonin levels around. But, but it is, you know, the, the, the set of models of human nature that are important for understanding the diversity and the richness, the fullness of, our, of who we are involves models at each of these levels and multidisciplinary ones. So not just neuro, whatever, but say linguistic or say some other sort of sorts of, you know, someone who does uh, psychology of emotion from a social science perspective, they probably have a very good mental model that's useful, really kind of useful and insightful under certain perspectives. And someone who does political psychology at, at a higher level, let's say Karen, Karen Stenner, who does... Um, uh, political psychology has written about the authoritarian dynamic as a kind of psychological trait. She does it at, at this level, and boy, you absorb her model, and all of a sudden you have a new perspective mm -hmm. on ourselves and human nature. And um, um, there is no one science of human right. nature. That's just a label, right? That for which you attach all these different disciplinary points of view. Exactly. Well, that's like NLP. You know, they say the map is not the territory. Yeah. Right. And you think of all these different types of maps. You have some that are extremely complex and then some that are very simple. But the reality is, the reality is taking all of those and layering it on top of one another, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we may have a snippet of that reality, but there's all these other dimensions that we're not looking at and, and honing in on, so... Yeah, that's a nice mental model. That's like a meta mental model for learning about a complex subject matter. And if you're talking about emotional intelligence, um, it's a very nice model because I think it gets exactly the right. What you have is a landscape of of different bodies of knowledge that are relevant to understanding this, and and the process of becoming literate and then proficient is this. Um, process of navigating, you know, becoming, exploring different parts of that landscape, coming to understand it better, and then cycling that back and saying, reflecting on it and, and applying it. How does this relate to me? How does this insight, how can this make an impact on how I behave in the world? But you don't stop there. It's a mistake to think that you've got the right, the single best model here. There's this whole terrain open to you. It doesn't have to stop. You can learn something new seek out new things. All of a sudden you broaden your perception and when you learn something new, it can change the way you thought about that other model too. It sort of has this feedback. Ah, oh, I see what I was 
you know, that was limited in some way here. So it's forward looking, it's growth oriented, right? It's not as, as opposed to, to static, you know, right. which is good. That growth oriented mindset is, is, is positive, to, is good to cultivate. It's also humbling in the sense that you can always say, I, I'm sure I don't have the full story. There's more to learn here. It um, it, it uh, important role for curiosity because curiosity is what will drive you to explore those other parts of the landscape. Um, and when you do that, you'll have greater capacity to be pos- have a positive influence on the people around you and, and the world around you. So it's a good meta mental model. Yeah. Well, and, and I also think of like a machine with all these gears or a watch, you know, and somebody's reality could be one of those gears. They say, well, all the other ones are not necessary because mine's moving, it's making things work. But then you take one other gear out, no matter how small it is or how large it is, and everything stops working, mm-hmm. right? So everything feeds into itself to make this one larger component. So mm-hmm. um, I have really enjoyed this conversation with you, Kevin. And I love seeing, I, I think philosophy is something that should be taught in schools. <laughs> Because it really teaches you to see things from alternative perspectives instead of just finding one truth. Um, So I really enjoyed hearing your, I would say, more holistic perspective. And thank you for kind of breaking down tribalism and how it relates to emotional intelligence. So It was my pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed your book.